Let's pray as we come to look at this section of John's Gospel. Our great God and Father, we ask that by your Holy Spirit, you would give us a fresh sense of the significance of the glory of the death of the Lord Jesus. Please, by your Holy Spirit, deepen our understanding and give us fresh delight in knowing you and serving you. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. I'm sure you're aware Easter is very early this year, uh, uh, just four Sundays away after this one. And as we approach Easter, we're going to spend most of our Sunday mornings in John's Gospel, working our way through his account of the death and resurrection of Jesus as recorded for us in chapters 18 to 21 of his Gospel. In case you were wondering, we will, I hope, get back to Philippians uh, sometime uh, after Easter and continue our journey through that uh, wonderful little letter. But for the moment, we're going to focus on the passion narrative in John's Gospel, focusing on the great central truths of the Christian faith. I hope that if you are exploring the faith or new to the faith, these chapters will give you a good basic understanding of the significance of the death and resurrection of Christ. And if you are well on in the faith, I hope our times in John will deepen your appreciation of all that Jesus has done for you. And anyway, studying John's gospel, you never quite get it, do you? There's always stuff that he's working on and drawing you into. We will all benefit, I am sure. And this morning, we're just going to look at the betrayal and the arrest of Jesus. This is the opening scene in John's passion narrative. Jesus has finished teaching his disciples in the upper room, and it's now time for action. And you'll know, of course, that if you're familiar with the New Testament, that the four gospel writers all give us the same kind of account. They're all the same big events, but they pick up various details. They emphasize various aspects. Well, as John gives us his account of the betrayal and arrest of Jesus, I don't think there is any doubt as to the key thing John is highlighting. You cannot really miss it. I read commentators. They usually disagree, but on this, it seems like they're actually reading the same book uh, as, as all. What is the key idea? It is that Jesus willingly, willingly goes to his death. Jesus surrenders himself into the hands of those who will murder him. We're just going to take a few moments and to see how this, how John's narrative brings that out. It's really, I think, important to see as we think about the death of Christ, his willingness to go, the way he surrenders himself. Notice where Jesus takes his disciples after their Passover meal and the long teaching session. They head out across the Kidron Valley. I don't know if you've ever been to Jerusalem. I've had the privilege of going about 35 years ago. And it's lovely to walk into the Kidron Valley there on the east side of the city. And you see the valley down down and to where they think the garden of Gethsemane was. And he takes them there across the Kidron Valley. Now... Verse 2 tells us, now Judas, who had betrayed him, knew the place because Jesus had often met with his disciples. Jesus goes to a place where he knows he can be found. If you are on the run from the authorities, if you want to avoid capture, you don't do, you go to the places where you normally hang out. I guess most of us will watch thrillers. You know, crime, or, you know, whatever sort of thrillers, you know, born movies. 
The CIA in Langley are looking for Bourne. What do they have? They have a map, as they will probably have in kind of police stations when they're looking for a criminal. They'll have a map of where his home is, where his mother lives, where his cousins are, where he normally drinks, where he works, where he can be found. They didn't need a big map on the wall to find Jesus. They didn't need to check through all the surveillance cameras. It's highlighting here, Judas knew where he would be. He went to his regular place because Jesus is going to go to his death willingly. The search party is looking for him now. They don't plan to mess up. They have loads of men. They come well equipped for a nighttime hunt. They won't need all of those weapons. They won't need all of those lanterns, of course. But it is interesting to read John's description of who comes looking for him. So Jesus comes to the garden, guarding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. Do you see the mix of the search party that comes looking for him? Judas the betrayer, the one who knew Jesus and has now turned against him. There are Roman soldiers, Gentiles, come looking for him. And there are the henchmen and the bully boys from the chief priests and Pharisees, the religious hypocrites. We have here a betrayer who knew the truth and turned against the truth. We have Roman soldiers, the power of the state to crush And we have the religious hypocrites, all determined to stamp out this teacher and miracle worker and the movement that is beginning. Well, this party approaches. What could Jesus have done at this point? Well, I take it he could have hidden in the garden. You know, they hear them coming, clank, 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 with their lanterns and their swords banging. This big party coming up the other side of the Kidron Valley. He could have sent one of his disciples out and said, who are you looking for? And they would have said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he could have gone, oh yeah, well, he went that way about an hour ago. No. Jesus goes out to them. And we're told that he now knows. He knows and has known exactly what will happen to him. With full knowledge of what will happen, he goes to surrender himself to what he knows must happen. And as we move into the arrest scene, I can't think there's been many arrests like this. We'd have to ask the policeman amongst us. I haven't been arrested, but I have seen the odd arrest. In fact, actually mainly at football grounds, 1980s style football. Uh, It was full of arrests, full of violence. You took your life into your hands if you ever went to a football match in the 1980s. And the fights would start and the police would pile in. None of the uh, uh, rioters I remember ever went, who is it you're looking for? And kind of walked out. They had to go and grab them as they ran. People run from arrest. Saddam Hussein ran, didn't he? But was found and executed. Gaddafi ran, was found and then was executed. I guess some arrests are kind of calm, but this is an extraordinary arrest, isn't it? He comes out. Who are you looking for? And it's interesting, I think John communicates that Jesus is sort of in charge here. He does the speaking. Who is the chairman of this meeting? It's Jesus. Normally you'd expect the main arresting officer or who is ever in charge to be in control of events. But Jesus is doing the questioning. Controlling the meeting. Who are they looking for? They give the answer, Jesus of Nazareth. And what does he say? I am he. Or simply, I am. And they fall back. Now my own view on this incident is that Jesus, the John is inviting us to see again who Jesus is to see the power of Jesus. 
When he says, I am he, he is both saying, yep, I'm the one you're looking for, but he's also saying, I am, which is one of the great divine names in the Old Testament. In that moment, he is revealing who he is, the great covenant Lord, the one who in Isaiah 14, when he speaks, people scatter and fall down. We're being shown as readers that Jesus could have, with just a word, have destroyed the arresting party. We're being shown that in no way is he being forced into this. He is going willingly. And I wonder also whether in some sense he is giving the arresting party a chance to see and have a glimpse of who he is before they push on with their evil acts. Jesus goes to his death willingly. There is this second exchange. Who is it you want? He asked them again, Jesus of Nazareth, they say, verse 7. I told you that I am he. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. He's the chairman of his meeting. The one in charge tells them how it's going to be. You take me, but you let them go. Presumably they had come to arrest the whole lot of them. But Jesus says, no, he negotiates, as it were, the terms of his surrender. I come, they go. They go free. Why? Well, John tells us this happened that the words he had spoken would be filled. I have not, would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those uh, you gave me. Referencing back to John 6, and I think back to John 10, and I think to John 17. You see, he's got to do it this way because that's the way he said he'd do it. He's not going to lose any of those who are his followers. And this gives us a little picture of what he's been speaking about in John 6 and been speaking about in John 17. This little incident where he is captured and goes to his suffering and death and they go free is a picture of bigger realities. He saves them in his arrest. He goes forward, but his followers are saved. He doesn't lose any he's been given. He dies, they go free. That's part of what he's come to do. Notice here the way Jesus' own words are treated as scripture. It's fascinating, isn't it? This happened so the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. That's a phrase that you use about scripture, be fulfilled. John knows that Jesus Christ is God, is a scripture speaker. If that's, uh, he gives us the very words of God. So Jesus goes to his death willingly and alone. And as he does that, he makes sure the disciples go free. Well, Simon Peter, in this narrative we see, just won't have it. He starts to defend his master. He gets out his sword and cuts off uh, one of the uh, arresting party's um, ear. Fascinating, we get the details here. The servant's name was Malchus. Now, of course, if you're feeling for Malchus and his detached ear, Dr. Luke, as you'd expect with a medical perspective in his gospel, records that Jesus repairs the damaged man uh, at this point. John doesn't go there. It's not what he's focusing on. And as, Jesus, as Simon Peter does that, Jesus, of course, 
rebukes him. He commanded Peter, put your sword away. Peter hasn't got it. He is zealous, but can't see that Jesus must go to his death. That he wants to go to his death. You see, I hope I've shown that the point of the rest narrative is so simple. What's being communicated here is just so clear. Jesus goes willingly to his death. Although he had the power to prevent it, and that's clearly demonstrated here, Jesus surrenders himself into the hands of those who would kill him. But that raises the question for us. Why? Why is he willingly going to this death? Why does he say, this is just what I've got to do? Now, if you're eagle-eyed, you'll notice verse 14, but we'll look at that in next week's passage, God willing. I'd like to focus in on verses 1 to 11, which I think are the section. And as we look at verses 1 to 11, we're going to ask, why? Why in these verses are we told? And we're going to look at John's gospel as well. Why? We see in verse 11 that he is to drink the cup the Father has given me. In other words, he has been given a, a work to do by the Father. And obedience to the Father is one of his primary things. All the way through the gospel, we see that Jesus is seeking to be obedient to the Father. The incarnate Son, the Son, God who has taken on flesh, looks to be obedient to the Father. All the way. And the Father has given him a work to do. To drink a cup. He is to drink a cup of suffering. In the Bible, the cup can be a cup of blessing, but it can be a cup of suffering. And here, he now must drink this cup of suffering in obedience to the Father. What is this cup? Can we just say more about it? It's clearly a cup of suffering. Can we say more than it just being a cup of suffering? Well, I think when we look back through the prophets, when they speak of the cup, Jeremiah, Isaiah, and Ezekiel all speak of the cup, of being the cup of suffering, the cup of God's wrath, of God's anger, God's righteous anger against sin. You see, it was the Father's will that Jesus gave himself up to death and to bear the wrath of God upon himself. Why take the wrath? Why take this suffering upon himself? Well, we've already had a picture in these verses of what he is doing. He goes forward to his death so that he might save the people, the disciples who have been given to him by the Father. He came to save those the Father had given him. You see, Jesus has a job to do, if I can put it like that. That work of taking the wrath, of dying for the people the Father has given him. It's worth, I think, just going back into John's Gospel just for us to meditate and reflect on these things. You can just listen if you like. If you'd like to turn back, I'm going to go back to John 6, verse 39, um, where we, get, we see these ideas. John 6, uh, 39. For my Father's will, you know what the Father wants, 
is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life. You see, there's a will here of the Father. If you go back into the verses, I have come down, verse 38, I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of the one who sent me. And this is the will of the one who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up on the last day. The will of the Father was that he would save those given to him by the Father. We see these things again in John chapter 10. We get the image of the shepherd. I am the good shepherd, verse 11. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. That's exactly what we're seeing him doing in the passion narrative. He's the good shepherd who is now laying down his life deliberately laying down his life for the sheep. And he goes on to say in verses 17 to 18, the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me. No one can take my life. But I lay it down of my own accord. I'll go willingly to this. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. We see, don't we, as he heads into the passion narrative, him going willingly because he is the good shepherd in love, laying down his life of his own accord to save the sheep. And he will protect them to the ends. What are the implications for us? What does all of this mean? Well, it may be you are a skeptic and you're just listening in and these, you're fresh to these things. Just worth noticing, please, that what we're being given here is eyewitness detail. Malchus, we've got the name of the guy. Things like that. John is written so that you might know all of these things and believe them. This is a historical account written that you might believe. As we reflect on this, we see that Simon Peter did not get the cross, at least at this point in his life. He was keen, he was thrashing around, but he didn't understand that Jesus had to die. Have you grasped that the cross is essential Maybe you're new to Christian things and you're thinking, well, you know, I love this Christianity thing. The way to do it is to go hard at it and be obedient and try hard. No. You just slow down and see that the cross was essential. Through the death of Christ is the way we're saved. And then I think the key thing from this passage for us all And it's what I want to remind you of and for you to see again from this passage which I think has been clearly communicated is that our salvation is something that God achieves for us in Christ. Our salvation is something that God achieves for us. You see, our deepest instinct is that to be made right with God, to be saved, our deepest instinct is that this is something that we must achieve, that we must do, that we must earn. That it depends upon my performance. No, no, no. In love, our salvation was planned by God the Father In love he had pity on the sinful children of Adam. And he planned a wonderful salvation for us. To rescue us, to restore us and to enjoy his presence forever. This plan, planned by God, was achieved, accomplished by the Son. 
who willingly and in love died for us in line with the Father's plan and commands. He accomplished it through his death and resurrection. And that salvation is applied to us. It becomes ours by the work of the Holy Spirit who works to open our eyes, to grant us saving faith and to unite us to Christ. We need to rest in this. To take a moment and recognize again that Jesus has willingly and in love done for me what I could never do for myself. Jesus has done for us what we could never ever do for ourselves. And he doesn't half do a job. Those he came to save, he saves. He doesn't make salvation possible. He achieves it and will take us safely home, not losing any of those who have been given to him by the Father. Now you might be thinking, what practical use is this to me? How does this help me on Monday morning? Actually, it helps you a lot. Because you go into your week to live the rest of your week, to risk the rest of your life to please this Lord Jesus who has so gloriously and wonderfully saved us that all of my life now becomes an offering in response to this astounding love and salvation. And I want to live a life worthy of this amazing salvation, reflecting the love and the holiness of the God who has, just, who has saved me. Rejoice and rest in this salvation this morning. And just one other lesson I think here for us. As you go into your week and as we live in our world, it is worth reflecting again on those who seek to destroy Jesus. The betrayer, the powerful military state, and the religious hypocrites. It's quite an alliance, isn't it? Jesus will give himself over to them. But their evil, and what they do truly is evil, only results in Jesus saving his people and then uh, gloriously being raised from the dead, of course. And I think we're seeing here a glimpse as these evil ones come for him, this alliance that right back in the beginning of John's gospel, we saw the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. It's as the darkness is coming for him but actually in the end, Jesus is just achieving what he wants to achieve and Jesus wins. And we may feel the power of darkness. Those who have walked away from the faith and now hate the faith and how painful that is to the church, the living church. And it's interesting the way that John has the betrayer now standing with the group. He's gone right over. We have the state, the power of the states that may well close in, seeking to silence the church. It may well be the state in alliance with the religious false teachers who deny the lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ and will not submit to his words. I think it's very contemporary. But Jesus will keep his people. Jesus will gather his people. And through his death and, death and resurrection, he wins. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that he came to achieve salvation, to accomplish salvation for us. And that he succeeded in that task and will succeed. 
And we thank you that our souls can rest in that as they go into their week. That Jesus Christ is indeed the one who has saved us. Help us to live in the light of this and help us to rejoice in it. In Christ's name, amen.